Welcome this day. It is great to see you. Good morning. Good morning. It is a blessing to be here. I hope it is a blessing to you to be here. You know, if you're fairly new to Nine Mile Falls Community Church, welcome. And uh, we pray God would touch your life. Because I see, and I know many see, that we need a touch in our life more than ever. If you look in your bulletin, it says the word opposition, the line in the sand. Uh, I changed that a little. It's actually oppression, which is opposition, but oppression. The line in the sand, the line in the stone. Two lines. And so we're going to talk about that today. Oppression is a line of force. Forcing. It is a line drawn by arrogant, self-indulgent, and critical people. As such, it changes with those people. The line of God is gracious, kind, merciful, and is always centered on others. The line of God never changes. Ever. It is an anchor point for our soul. It is a line indeed set in stone. And we sang that this morning. Did Jesus pay it all? Amen. Amen. You mean all, all? There's a little bit of all. See, we actually believe in Christ Jesus here. We actually believe and are centered on him and his word. It even says so out front, so we have to think that. The first line we're going to speak of today is the line of God in stone. And this will be our focus for the first portion of this message. Turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, if you would, chapter 4. <clears throat> Many in the evangelical world, if you ask, well, what kind of church is this? We would say, well, we are a fundamental, conservative, evangelical, independent church. Okay, <laughs> which is all true uh, for us. Many of the preachers of late in the evangelical church have been proclaiming prophecy. And sometimes in the procl proclamation of prophecy, it is, yeah, 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 that's way out there. That's, that's m miles away from us. We want to deal with reality. Well, the prophecies of God, indeed, as we'll see, are reality. They are as real as you are here today. Uh, many, and I live in the expectation, that the end of this message will be in glory. <laughs> I just look for that. Now, how will that occur? Because there is some carved in stone lines. And so we're going to deal with a couple of those lines right up front. The first one is 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 15. This is an encouragement to the church of Thessalonica from Brother Paul, because people were wondering, you know, they lived in the expectation of the Lord returning for his church. But they were afraid of those who had died, who were in Christ, well, what happens to them? And so Paul is saying, comfort one another. These are words of comfort. These are words of encouragement. And I hope they are to you this day. Verse 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the word of God. You see, we're real keen on the word of God here, as we should be, as you should be. The word of God is unchanging. It hasn't changed since it was penned. 
It's not changing today. It's not going to change tomorrow. No matter how many people vote to change it, to ignore it, to reject it, it's going to stand fast for an eternity. God's first line in the stone is that he is coming for those that trust in him. We call that the rapture of the church. Rapture being part of the makeup of the word caught up. We're brought up. The rapture of the church being caught up to Christ himself is imminent. It means it could happen at any second. There's no other prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. There's no other requirement that needs to be fulfilled. It is imminent. It is drawn by the finger of God on the face of the earth. It is immovable. It is steadfast. It is secure. And you need to know that. You need to know that. God is going to come from, or for, from glory, for his people. Descend in the clouds. We will hear the trump of God, a trumpet. We will hear the voice of Michael. Christ will descend in the clouds and we will ascend to him. And we're going to see <clears throat> that happens instantly. There's no, okay, he's almost here. <clears throat> I watched a video. It said 10 minutes before the rapture. And what do you do in the 10 minutes before the rapture? And the answer is nothing. Because you don't know when it's occurring. There is no 10 minutes. There is no time period. It doesn't have to go out in space or in time, centuries. No. As we look around today, we see, you know what? This is getting closer. This is getting closer. And that means something else is getting closer, which again is drawn on the earth by God himself. These are lines that when Almighty God puts them down, they're set. They are set. Doesn't matter what the culture says. Doesn't matter what your employer says. They are set. And there is a day coming. And so we're going to combine that with Matthew 24. Now Matthew 24, if you turn there, <laughs> Matthew 24 is such fascinating work. Jesus has asked a question, and I want to just point out a couple things before I actually go to our text, which our text is a little later on in the chapter, but I want to point out a couple things. Verse 3, Matthew 24, the disciples are sitting there together. They come to him privately, and they say to him, tell us when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And so what they're talking about is his coming to rule and reign. We call this the second coming. Again, it is a line drawn on the ground. It is not the same line as the rapture of the church. And so Christ gives a bunch of information. What it's going to look like. One of the things he says is about the earthquakes on the earth. Uh, I want you to notice something. It just occurred to me this last week, maybe a week and a half, two weeks, looking at the earth. Okay? Do you know how many volcanoes are suddenly exploding? I mean, exploding a lot around the earth. Spain, Italy, Argentina, everywhere. Uh, Yellowstone Park. They go, man, we haven't seen geysers like this almost forever. It just looks like the earth is exploding from the inside. When you look at all of it, it's massive. And I think, yep. That's what I think. Okay? It's occurring. But he says something else in verse 12. Lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. Absolutely true for every moment that we live in today. Absolutely true. When you start sewing these pearls together in a necklace, you think, wow, this is close 
close, time-wise. This is right imminent. It's close. If that's close, there's something else that's even closer. And I want to point this out to you. Verse 21, there will be a great tribulation. Great tribulation. And I'm just, again, just going to point these out. All right? And we'll see that again in just a second. There's a tribulation. So it's talking about after the tribulation period. There's a period of seven years, which follows immediately behind the rapture of the church. We are caught up. Seven years of tribulation occur. And then the second coming. Those are the bookends. Those are the lines drawn on planet Earth which are immovable. Okay? And I want to point something else out. Verse 36, Matthew 24. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Verse 42. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Verse 44, for this reason you shall must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Verse 50, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour which he does not know. So are all the evangelicals around the United States wrong? No. They know it's approaching. They know it's coming. We don't know what hour. We don't know what day. There's no man on planet Earth, no angel, that knows that day, that moment, but God the Father. Okay? And that is the moment of the Son's return to Earth, the second coming. Now I'm going to back up just for a second here to verse 29. Remember verse 21 had great tribulation. Uh, it also occurred in verse 9. But verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. There is an amazing event that is transpiring. Christ gives a parable that goes to this as they've been studying parables. Learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender, puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. And that's what he's talking about. You see all these things? It is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is right at the door. Right at the door. We're at the threshold of what God brings us. Truly I say to you, this generation will not will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of man will be like just like the days of Noah. For in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two women will be grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert. If you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this that if the head of the house had known what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. 44. For this reason, you be ready to. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour, you do not think he will. This second line that God has engraven upon the earth follows the seven-year tribulation. This line of the second coming of Christ is an amazing thing. 
you see where it says that there will be two men in the field. One will be, t this is verse 40. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Some people think that's the rapture, where there's two people side by side, and one's taken to glory, and one's not. But this, obviously, because of exactly what's been said, is not the rapture. So therefore, there's two people at work. One is taken. At the second coming, the people taken are the unsaved. And they are not taken to glory. They are destroyed. The only people left standing on planet Earth when Christ returns is the saved. They're the ones left standing in the field at the mill. Why? Because that's the judgment of God. You see, there are only two sides to the line. Two sides. Those with God on one side. Because God has ordained. If you indeed, as we say, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shall be saved. That automatically, by the grace of God, by the blood of Christ, places you on one side of the line and one side only. The problem we have, all you sinners, especially those back in the outer darkness. <laughs> See, I move more people to the front by saying that. <laughs> those people, and there will be people in the church that will find themselves who have compromised with the world, who've accepted worldly standards, who've allowed the flavor and the the evil of the world to guide, direct, and incorporate into their lives. They have become carnal. And some, you have to even ask the question, are you even saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ or not? You see, I don't draw that line. He drew it. God drew it. You can fool me. People can fool each other. You cannot fool God. He knows your heart. So I want to make sure I'm on the right side of the line. That I'm him. That I have trusted in the Lord. Why? Because it's not my strength. It's his strength. I seek him. Why? Because he paid it all. I paid nothing. He paid it all. Hebrews tells us one sacrifice for all sin. For all time. I accepted that. I put my faith, my confidence, and my trust in that. And so that's the people that are standing on God's side of the line. Those with God on one side, and those who oppose, opposition, if you will, God on the other side. There is no neutral ground. There is no neutral ground. There is no fence sitting. A person say, well, I haven't quite decided whether I'm going to trust in Christ or not. Ah, you have decided then. Because you're not. There is no middle ground. Not in God's word. And so, let's talk about the line in the sand for just a few moments. This line is written by man. It is an oppressive and harsh line. Turn to Exodus. Right up front in your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, should be right there somewhere. Exodus chapter 3. Drop down to verse 9. God speaking. Exodus 3, verse 9. Now, behold. The cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. God is aware, number one, of the opposition. But he is certainly aware of the oppression of his people. What had once been a blessing to save the nation of Israel had become a crushing pressure that threatened to destroy them. Drop down to verse 15, Exodus chapter 5, 5.15. 
this oppression becomes great. Verse 15, Exodus 5, the foremen of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks. Behold, your servants are being beaten. And this is the fault of your own people. Verse 17, but he said, You are lazy, very lazy. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So go now and work, for you shall be given no straw. Yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. Verse 19, and the foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told you must not reduce the daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they went, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in the hand to kill us. The foreman for Israel goes to the Pharaoh and he tells them, it's your fault. It's the government's fault. And the government replies, as even governments today reply, no, it's your fault. We have all this misery because you're unvaccinated. We have all this misery because you're white. Well, that's interesting. You see, that's this. And then, what happens to the people? Do they listen to God? Do they bind themselves together in unity and harmony? No. They go, let's go get Moses and Aaron. We can't do nothing with Pharaoh and his army. So let's go whack our spiritual leaders. Okay, is that the way this works out? And the answer is no. No matter how oppressive it becomes, do not blame, and this is what they're doing, God. God, this is your problem, this is your fault. See, we are so in the habit of finding blame, assigning blame to others. And there is some of that that can go around, and we'll see that in a minute. This oppression takes form of mocking and ridicule. It results in beatings. It is a demanding force that compels compliance or suffer instead of turning, turning on the oppressors, the people of Israel turn on God. That's who they, they turn on the spiritual leaders, but they're really turning on God. Now in Acts chapter 7, Stephen addresses this very issue. Stephen, the first martyr of Christianity. Stephen gives a testimony to the religious people of the day. And he reminds them of the oppression of the past to explain to them the oppression of the current, the current time, the current day. So in Acts chapter 7, verse 34, he recounts exactly what we've read. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, have heard their groans. I have come down to deliver them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you ruler and judge? Is the one whom God sent to be both ruler and deliverer, with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Stephen recounts what the spiritual leaders should already know. This was never the fault of spiritual leadership. Now, if the spiritual leadership in this can occur and has occurred in the, quote, church today, that if they are compromising with the world, Okay? They're ineffective. They are worldly. I don't care what the reason is. If they will not stand firm on the word of God, cast them out. Should we show grace and mercy? Absolutely. We all need that. But the church in compromise is a dead church. 
We will not compromise with the world. That's just not going to occur here. And Stephen points that out. Look at verse 51. He accuses the religious people. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Stephen puts his finger right in their nose. He says, you, you are guilty of this oppression. You are guilty of killing God's people. Killing, trying to kill God's word. Has there been a time when you've never done that? And today, there is no shortage of leaders which fall into that. Now, many of the evil leaders of today, they don't want to hear from you. Christian. They don't want to hear the word of truth from you. And so they respond today just like they did in verse 54. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. You ever have someone make you so mad? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> that you're kind of grinding your teeth. You're wondering, man, I, I hope I don't break off all those nice pretty caps I put in there. Okay, hopefully you've resided to be a little less angry than that. But they're cut to the heart. Why? Because Stephen has, sh he's, he has taken the word of God as a piercing sword and stabbed them right in the center of their shriveled up, corrupt heart. That's what he's done. And that's what men and women in Christ are doing today. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of the young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep or died. This morning, Brother Mike, somewhere around here, he gave, oh, there he is, change seats. That's me up. I uh, talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Do you forgive? Do you have a heart of forgiveness? You see, oppression, the word for oppression, it actually means to press or to distress or to afflict, to crush, to force. It is an evil Affliction. Oppression in the Bible is an evil crushing force of affliction. It is experienced any time the evil ones of the world force their desires on other people. Do you hear that? It is experienced any time the evil ones of the world force their desires on other people. They are a stiff-necked people, an obstinate people, a people with a hardened heart. We covered that this week in our studies about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. Sometimes by God, sometimes by his own self. Hardened heart. I am not receptive. We're not listening. There's no logic. There's no rationale that you can give them. Why? Because the Bible says they are stiff-necked. They are hardened heart. Hearted people. They resist the influence and direction of the Holy Spirit. They resist the influence and direction of the Holy Spirit. And what that means? They will not make godly decisions because they resist the Holy Spirit who guides them into truth. Now, you can claim that they're Christians all they want. Lots of people do who aren't Christians. They can claim they go to church. Well, there's lots of organizations that have the word church on them, lots of which are not churches at all. Church is defined in your Bible as a group, an assembly of like-minded believers in Christ. That's the definition. 
So if Christ isn't part of your religious dogma, you're not a church. You can call it that whatever you want. Go ahead. If that's what you have to put down on the 5013C so you won't have to pay tax, fine. But know this, you're not a church. Not those who resist the Holy Spirit, not those who rebel against God. And you're standing on the line that one day will be left behind any day, any time. And then they're going to stand on a line carved in the stone of God's heart. Okay? Stone, hardness, wrath, anger, where they will be turned to dust. Oppressors often say, we're going to hurt you if you don't comply. Now recently, we've had a lot of statewide mandates, governmental mandates, Egyptian mandates, Assyrian mandates, Babylonian mandates. There's lots of those. And since this country is no longer a Christian country, which it is not, okay, you might want to think so, and again, you can think so, but it is not. It is far more Babylonian, Egyptian, Assyrian than Christian. And so these mandates come. I, as you have noticed in the local news around our city, that reports of hundreds have lost their jobs or are fixing to lose their jobs in the state. Uh, some have lost their jobs already this last week. More to follow because of mandates. Medical workers, police officers, firefighters, first responders in every area, educational people, military people, governmental or federal workers. The great side of that because, you know what, the plague did bring greatness. It raised up a church who now is far more aware of the oppression of the government, of the state, of the enemy of God. Aren't you more aware of it? I hope you are. I pray you are. So what happens? Do you know lawsuits are piling up? And they are piling up to the sky. Okay? Uh, I understand that. Perhaps you heard of an airline that says, you're all fired if you don't get the stab or the jab or whatever fancy word we're using for it today. Okay? And so the main workers, pilots and others, others, okay, we're not coming to work. And those people shut that airline down. Then the government said, oh, uh, weather, technical problems. Well, if you meant weather is that people are in a storm, if you meant technical problems, they didn't show up to turn old Bessie on and fly it. Yeah, because that was proven. And it was shown over and over, but yet, the oppressors said, no, 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 we've we got things under control. Because there's no way they were going to admit that a major company yielded to the Because then they sent out a thing, hey, okay, you're not on leave without pay anymore. You can come in until your uh, assessment can be made of your affidavits and so forth, where you have an exemption, whether medical, religious, whatever, till that can get processed. Oh, hey, you can come back to work while you're getting ready to even consider that or file it. They basically said, please come back to work so we can function. I liked it. Okay? They say, Pastor, that's not very forgiving. Well, I'll forgive them if they want forgiveness. But Solomon says, a fool is a fool by their own choice. 
They reject wisdom. They reject wisdom, specifically godly wisdom. I was really encouraged by a news article last night. The discouraging part of it, there is a leader in Chicago. <sighs> leader in Chicago. 36% of their police force is looking to get fired or terminated. And the leader says, yep, they're getting terminated. And the leader says, it's their fault. How can they be doing this to themselves? Bizarre, bizarre things. So there's a senator in nearby Indiana that says, all of you police officers in Chicago, you are welcome here. No restriction, no stabbing and jabbing. Just come here, and it's just right close. Come to work. I liked him already. I said, isn't that what we're to do? Support one another, love one another, encourage one another, instead of hurting one another, instead of this oppression? David, Solomon, Asaph, in the Psalms, all speak of the oppression of mankind. They say that these oppressors, which we have amongst us today, by vast numbers, Psalm 62, 9, don't have to turn there, just listen. Men of low degree are only vanity. They are of low esteem. They are lowly. Hence the idea, loathsome, in who they are. And they are just a vanity. We're reading in our men's group on Thursday night, we started the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Okay? All of these men and women of low degree are vanity. They're mist, they're vapor, they are nothing. Nothing. You say, no, no, it's my boss. No, they are nothing. Nothing compared to the line that God has placed on the earth. Men of rank, they're a lie. Men of high standing, or whoever considers themselves to be of high standing, that's a lie. They're only of high standing in God through Christ. And if they don't know him, they are men of low degree. They are together lighter than breath. They are meaningless. Verse 10 of that psalm. Oh, did I, I forgot to give you the psalm. Psalm 62. Do not trust in oppression. God, speaking to the oppressors, don't trust in that oppression. Don't think that you're going to stand on the neck of thousands of perfectly good employees who do a great job and get away with it. That's what that means. Don't be standing and hurting your people and think, oh, our people are so loyal to us and they'll come back. Did you know in some of these organizations, people have taken the stab, the jab, and they quit too. I thought, amen. Do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Verse 11, once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Power. Power is given to mankind to administer. If the mankind abuses the power, misuses the power, there's a reckoning for that. And God has that carved in stone. The type of oppression that's talked about here in the Psalms is also called extortion. It is a violence used to exert the will of some on earth, on others. It is coercion, forced compliance. I know this well. Forced compliance. You make people yield to you. And if they don't, you force them to. 
And there's all manner of doing that. Forced compliance, extortion. Some people are being extorted by virtue of, well, you can't buy groceries no more. You can't feed your family. In fact, you know what? You might not even get unemployment. That's what the words that come from an extorter's mouth. And any company who says that, they are indeed complying with extortion and oppression, forced compliance. That company is not worth air and should not be. Psalm 73, verse 6. Why do they do these things? Pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulge from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. Man. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. You know, we've seen a lot of people on the news, on television, public, publicly saying things. They should probably quit doing that. They really should. Because everything, every mouth that parades itself in public is parading itself to God. He's public, right? And of course, there's many in the administration that we know, they should never speak in public again. <laughs> they just shouldn't, because they are overwhelmingly an embarrassment, just a sad embarrassment when they do. You know, I remember a time when there were certain leaders in our country where they're speaking, and you would actually turn to wherever to hear them speak. Now, maybe some of you don't do that anymore. Well, that's the way we grew up. Okay, back in the olden days. Now, a picture comes up. Oh, news broadcast. Click. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Me and Patty, I tell her quite often, hey, turn it to Bugs Bunny Roadrunner <laughs> so we can have some reality. <laughs> it's just the way my mind works some days. They speak of forcefully crushing people and extorting them, and they seem proud of it. They deliberately forget that the power belongs to the Lord. So here's our prayer. I want you to turn there. Psalm 119, verse 133. Here's our prayer. I would like this to be your prayer. If it's not, you should consider it. Psalm 119, Old Testament. 133, establish my footsteps in thy word. Set my feet in your word. You, Christ follower, need to have your feet anchored, set, established, firmly put into the word of God. That's where you need to be standing. Pray that God will help you stand there and not be carried away by every wind of doctrine, every sea of man, every corruption, every oppression, every extortion, every torture of man. Lord, establish my feet in thy word. And do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. The problem with facing so many oppressors, so many extorters, is you want to become one. Oh yeah? You do that to me, here's what I'm going to do to you. That's what we think. That's the human nature side of us. They hurt us, we want to hurt them back. And we want to hurt them back worse than they hurt us. And that's the flavor of the world today. And in fact, people want to hurt you, and they don't even know you. And that hurt is called persecution, 
and it will come. It already is coming. Do not let any of that iniquity, that perversion, iniquity, perverting that which is good, perverting the word, do not, Lord, let that fall on me. Please, seal my mouth shut if I'm going to pervert the word of God. And then, he goes on, verse 134. Redeem me from the oppression of man. Bring me out from underneath the boot, if you will, the torture of the extortioner, the blackmailer, the briber. Redeem me, purchase me out of, bring me out of that. We sang that today, that I am redeemed. I have been bought. I have been purchased by his blood. I just have to act that way. And some days that's not so easy. But the church of Christ Jesus is unified together on that. That we have been rescued, brought out, redeemed, purchased, ransomed out of the oppression of mankind. And then finally it says in that verse, that... I may keep thy precepts. Bring me out of this mess that I can keep you. That I can keep following your word. It goes right back up to verse 133. Establish my footsteps in your word and keep me there. Redeem me out of this oppressive position in our country right now so that I can continue to stand there. Because I, in my own human weakness, some days seemingly are blown away. And I don't want to be. I know you don't either. Establish me. The day of our true redemption, true not being, the cross is true, okay? The day that that occurred, some people say, I've always been a Christ follower. Amen. Amen. I can't say that. But I do remember those times when I came to Jesus Christ. And a time of rededication when I came to him and then kind of doo -doo -doo, drifted sideways. I was redeemed, but I was stupid. Terribly ignorant. Well, not only ignorant of his word, even the words that I did know some days, I, mm, yeah, I don't want to hear that. But then my redemption, which was accomplished on the cross of Calvary, will be fulfilled in his presence. Soon, soon, the day draws near. The rapture is coming. And it's not like it's coming to us. We are moving to it. Because it is carved in stone. And there have never been more clear signs that that is imminent. When the Lord, our Lord, appears on his line of time, those on his side of the line will be caught up out of the oppression of mankind. What a glory that will be. Do you know everything in glory, we don't speak of this too often and we should, everything in glory, everything in heaven makes sense. Because it is established all by God. It is perfectly logical. It is perfectly reasonable. Wouldn't it be a joy to just have a day of that? I think it would be. After the tribulation, seven year period, there's a second coming. Those on the side of the extortioners, the oppressors, oppressors will find themselves plunged into an even greater chaos than that now exists or has ever existed. Do you think in Hades that it makes sense to them? That they are suddenly logical and rational? They might rationalize. But according to the rich man in Luke 16, he understands why he's there. And his message from the grave would be, you go back and tell my brothers 
don't come here because it is a reality. In the whatever medical facilities that remain standing, one will be taken, the other left. What's ever left of a police force, one will be taken, the other will be left. In every governmental office, one will be taken, and the other left. In whatever is left of education, one will be taken, one will be left. Our job, stay in the word where God has put you, pray for that, and then proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of his word until we cross the line into glory. Amen. Amen. Turn to your bulletin, if you would, for just a few moments.